All right. <clears throat> I'm just going to pick up where I left off. Last Wednesday night, as we marched through the information concerning Muhammad. At the beginning of the message that I preached last Sunday night, I mean last Wednesday night, I stated something which I want to state again tonight. It's more like a question, really, than a statement. If we were to study Christianity, could we leave Jesus Christ out of that study? Think about it. If we were to study Christianity, could Jesus Christ be out of the equation? Of course, the answer is obvious. No. There is no Christianity without Jesus Christ. There is no New Testament without Jesus Christ. There would just be an Old Testament. So if that's the case, if we were to study Islam, is there any way possible that we could leave Muhammad out of the study? Once again, it's obvious. The answer is no. Because without Muhammad, there is no Islam. That's why, even though some are frustrated, that's why I've taken the time, and I'm going to take the time, not give you every single detail about Muhammad. I don't have one year to spend on it. I don't want to spend one year on it, to tell you the truth. It's hard enough to preach on this subject matter alone, but I can't avoid it if I'm going to include it in this study on eschatology, what we call the last day series. You cannot leave Muhammad out of the equation either. Because like I said, there is no Islam. There is no Koran. There is no Hadiths. There is no Surahs. There is none of that. There is no Kabbalah. Well, actually, Kabbalah existed before Islam, but not in the aspect and the relationship that Muslims have with it today. None of that would be in existence unless Muhammad came on the scene. And I will show you when I get there, not yet, will we find that in Scripture. And I'm not talking about Revelation chapter 13 or anything in the book of Daniel. It'll be clear once I get there, but until I get there, let's go behind the scenes and looking at Muhammad's life. And we've done quite a bit of it already. We have a lot to go. So I'm gonna push forward. And last time that we got together here last Wednesday night, I was on Muhammad, more of an, on his message. Tonight I wanna look at the miracles, the so-called miracles. Miracles that some of his followers, after he died, proclaimed that he did. Some that Muhammad proclaimed that he can do or did. And to show you, most of those, all of those, were nothing more than lies and deceit. And when he couldn't provide a miracle, he came up with a pretty good excuse, at least convincing the ones that wouldn't even be convinced by it, the reasons why he couldn't even do the miracle or miracles. So with that, let me pick it up. With some of the claims, supposedly, Muhammad perform such miracles. 
all the miracles that were attributed to Muhammad so as to make him look saintly. Like I said, some by his followers after his death even. Many of the miracles were fabricated by his followers. There are many miracles which were claimed by Muhammad himself, which no one but he, which no one but he could verify, and many contemporary Muslims doubted them because some of these, well, they were not necessarily Muslims back then. So that's why I differ. They weren't called that at that particular time, the ones that were contending with it in the early stages when Muhammad was trying to convince them that he got a direct message from Gabriel that was from God. But they doubt it anyway because some of these miracles are so ridiculous that they are hardly more than childish jokes, childish jokes, and Muhammad proved himself to be a laughingstock. Remember, he was ran out of town. He went to hide in caves when his message originally, when he came in, preaching it, wasn't accepted. And he took off. He escaped from the angry Meccans and he went to hide in caves. It is recorded in the Quran that the pagan Meccans repeatedly asked Muhammad to perform a miracle so that they could believe him. In the Quran we find, quote, they say, we will not believe in you until you make a spring gush from the earth for us or until you own a garden of palms and vines and cause rivers to gush forth with abundant water in them or until you cause the sky to fall upon us in pieces as you have claimed or as a surety bring Allah with the angels in front, or until you possess an ornate house of gold or ascend into the heavens, which by the way, he proclaimed he did eventually. And we will not believe in your ascension until you have brought down for us a book which we can read. And of course, you find that in the Quran, 17th chapter, I believe the 90 to 93 or four verses. So Allah performed a miracle for him, which was witnessed by Meccans. After all, Allah's miracles are not jokes. With Allah's divine help, Muhammad performed the following miracle. We don't know how many Meccans were really impressed by this miracle. According to the old tradition, when the Meccans demanded Muhammad to prove his divine mission by making a mountain move, Muhammad replied that only Allah has the power to do that. However, by the repeated demands from Meccans, Muhammad thought of giving it a try. Turning to the direction of Mount Safa, Muhammad commanded it, to do, commanded it to come to him, but with much embarrassment to Muhammad, nothing happened. Then Muhammad exclaimed, quote, Allah is compassionate. Had it come, it would have caused an earthquake or fallen upon us to our destruction. I will therefore go to the mountain instead and thank God for his mercy, end of quote. So when he couldn't perform that miracle, have the mountain come to him, he devised an excuse why Allah decided that was not a miracle that he could perform because after all, he was looking after the benefit of mankind. And look how much destruction, look how much lives lost, damage that, that would have created. So, Muhammad went to the mountain to praise Allah for his mercy, that he had that foresight. Surprisingly, even Muslims read this story with the spectacle of faith, they see a miracle in it. They see a miracle in it. Then again, some Meccans ask Muhammad to send Gabriel or some other angel to them so that they can believe Muhammad. Quote, O Muhammad, if an angel had been sent with thee to speak to men about thee, and to be seen with thee, end of quote, by seeing Muhammad in trouble. Allah came for his rescue and replied in a revelation. You can find that in the Quran, chapter 6. Then in order to send an angel, 
he would have to make him appear as a man, and that would have left the non-believers back where they have started. Which doesn't really make much sense if you really think about it, but he came up with that excuse. Allah also consoled Muhammad, telling him that before him, many other prophets were mocked also. Also in the Quran we find, quote, they say, why is not an angel sent down to him? If we s did send down an angel, the matter would be settled at once, and no respite would be granted them. If we had made him an angel, we would have given him the resemblance of a man, and would have such confused them with that in which they are already confused. Other messengers have been mocked before you, but those who scoffed at them were encompassed by that they had mocked. End of quote. Oh, well, there's one more in a different part of the Quran. Messengers before thee indeed were mocked, but that where, whereat they mocked surrounded those who scoffed at them. They really didn't answer the question. They didn't really perform the miracle. All he could ever do was come up with the excuses why it couldn't be done. Why could it be done? Why? Because they were comparing it to what they knew. Even these Meccans who were idol worshippers knew that when miracles came on the scene, such as Moses and Jesus, it's not like they couldn't get things accomplished. After all, Jesus rose the dead. I mean, rose Lazarus from the dead. He healed people. He walked on water. He produced food for thousands and so forth. Moses... Well, God did it, but through Moses, part of the Red Sea, plus all the plagues. Let me give you some of the history. The Me Meccans again wanted to know why there was no miracle if Allah was so powerful. Muhammad was comparing himself to Moses and Jesus. Both of them were visited by angels and did miracles. Why Muhammad could not? See, it's like they, they were not giving the message, both Old and New Testament message. In this case, throughout Saudi Arabia. And that's not the only location, by the way. They just chose to reject it. But they knew. Their definition of what, if they were prophets, this is what they did, according to the Old and New Testament. Even though they didn't have it in the form of a Bible, but they had the stories to go with it. By the ones that preached it, that spread the word concerning God's Miracles of the old and what Jesus did in the new. Both of them were visited by angels that did miracles. Why Muhammad could not? The Meccans disputed his claims and mocked him, mocked him mercilessly, saying his religion was a forgery, a counterfeit. Throughout the pages of the Quran, at least 20 times, his clan accused him of being the only prophet who couldn't do a miracle. Muhammad's inefficiency in producing even a single miracle is well recorded by his biographer. In this biography, he wrote that Abu Lahab and Abu Safyan, two of the women of the Quraysh, repeatedly asking Muhammad to perform some miracles. They ask, quote, Why don't you change Mount Safa and Mount Moriah into gold? Why don't you cause the book of which you speak so much to fall down from heaven already, already written? Why don't you cause Gabriel to appear to all of us and speak to us as he spoke to you? Why don't you resurrect the dead and remove these mountains which bound and enclose the city of Mecca? Why don't you cause a water fountain to spring water which is sweeter than that of Zamzan, knowing how badly your, oh, your own town needs the additional water supply? End the quote. They challenged him to do as much as Moses or Jesus had done. The unbelievers did not stop at these demands for miracles. In ridicule, the Meccans ask, quote, Why doesn't your God inform you of the market prices of the future in order to help you and us in the trade of the morrow? End of quote. All these questions and demands were answered once and for all by a revelation. God commanded Muhammad, quote, Say, I have no power whatever to bring advantage or avoid disadvantage. What God wills, that will happen. If it were given to me to tell the future, I would have used such knowledge to my own advantage. 
But I, and o- I am only a man sent to warn you and a message to convey a divine message that you may believe. End of quote. The fact is that Muhammad never wanted to be a miracle worker simply because he could not perform any miracles. But he claimed the title of prophet and accepted the fact that, as Bukhari recorded, every prophet before him was given miracles because of which people believed them. The pagan Megans, Meccans could not be blamed for troubling Muhammad for manning at least one miracle. From other parts of Arabia, there were many charlatans. Who claimed to be God's messenger? They had at their disposal magical tricks which they presented as proof of their divine mission. One of them, who had a sizable following from his own tribe, he used to run up and down the he used to run up and down the country showing a flask with a narrow neck, in which he had inserted an egg, which he had learned from a Persian juggler. This was his miracle. He also recited rhymed sentences that he passed as verses of a second Quran. This proves how much it was necessary for the man to produce some tricks as miracles to promote himself to the rank of prophet in that area. The claims of traditional Islamic sources that Muhammad was a chosen prophet of Allah before his birth. And hence, he was born guided. He was born guided. The fact is that Muhammad had been fathered by an adulterer and his mother was a pagan woman. Muhammad received his first revelation when he was meditating in a desert cave at the age of 40, which we already covered. Till that time, he knew nothing about the Quran. So that should raise a question, right? If he was born guided, why did he waste 40 years of his life and thus knowingly neglected Allah's command? In fact, Muhammad was not religious before he claimed the title of a prophet. Before he immigrated to Medina, he did not even know that the Jews and Christians have serious theological differences. He assumed that the Jews and Christians belong to a single faith. Obviously, Muhammad had a religion until the age of 40, and this could not be anything but the faith of his forefather. If he was born guided, how Allah allowed it? After all, Allah is supposed to be all-knowing. One of the Hadiths, quote, I recognize a stone in Mecca which used to pay me salutations before my advent as a prophet, and I recognize that even now, end of quote. From that Hadith, it is obvious that Muhammad used to visit the Kaaba before his prophethood, when 360 statues were worshipped by different Arab tribes. So, if for worshiping the statues, the non-believers are roasting in hell, Muhammad is also roasting in hell with them. That's the only assumption you can, you can make, because that's the assumption. That's what he preached after he received the message from Gabriel. You had to give up all those other idols and gods. Which, by the way, they didn't, even Muhammad didn't, because it was reduced down to maybe three. Which we already covered in earlier teachings. But nevertheless, if he was guided, the point is, from his birth, as a chosen prophet of God, and we already seen in previous teachings how he even placed himself in the same level of Allah in several occasions, when we quoted from the Hadiths and his own historical biographers and historians near to his lifetime or in his lifetime heard from his own lips, put him at the same level as Allah. Why did he know beforehand when he was going to the Kaaba 
those idols should be eliminated. But he joined in with the practice that was taking place in Mecca and in Medina. He didn't come against it then. Did Allah accept it back then? It doesn't add up, is what the point is. And if non-believers are going to roast in hell because of those idols, then how come Muhammad, well, he eventually saw the light. Well, if he was guided from birth, why didn't he see the light sooner is the point. Also at his birth, the angels started singing and the idols everywhere fell on their faces. And fires of all fire worshippers in Persia and India became cold. A lake flooded with cause, which caused a palace to crack at the birth of Muhammad. The only problem with that is no historian ever recorded in any of those areas, which there's quite a bit of distance. Imagine the distance between where he was born and India. It's just not a few miles, folks. Noah's story every chord of the songs sung by angels or idols fall a fire, fall because of the fire, be, and fall or the fire became cold. No one's ever reported that. You can't find that. I've searched. I can't find it. If something extraordinary had happened, we could have known all about them in the history books. They seem to want to record, most of it's fabricated, anything about Muhammad. Why not that? It was just a story that was being told from one generation down to another generation. Of course, as the generations passed, it became even more a fantasy story-like tale. Also, Muhammad is really such a great miracle worker. Why could he not perform a single miracle in front of the Meccans? Muslims claim that Muhammad was born detached, now here's a good one, from the umbilical cord. Their claims cannot be true. Umbilical cord is the only source supplying nourishment and an unborn baby cannot stay alive in the womb without being attached to it. Well, that's why it's a miracle. That's their excuse, that's their reasoning, that's their justification. If this fable was true, Muhammad would have lived without food and water after birth. Obviously, he didn't need any food or water or any nourishment from his mother because he had a detached umbilical cord. It was not important and necessary back then to keep him alive. So after he came out of that womb, why did he need any food and water? Now, that would have been a miracle. I don't know about you, but I would have had to take a second look at Muhammad. If I could prove that he doesn't eat, he doesn't drink, he just exists and doesn't die. What does he have that we don't? Well, it didn't happen that way. He did, he did, eat, he did drink. If the fable was true, Muhammad would have lived without food and water after birth, but he did need food and water like everybody else. The story of pregnant Amina is equally nonsense. If she had really witnessed any such divine occurrence, she would have taken much care of Muhammad by herself instead of giving him to a nurse, Halima. In sum, there was not a single miracle to, pro to prove Muhammad's claim of prophethood. There were no healings, no walking on water, no parting the seas, no raising folks from the dead, or feeding multitudes. There are no fulfilled prophecies like the exacting and detailed predictions that biblical prophets routinely made to demonstrate their divine authority. But the most troubling part about our absolute reliance on Muhammad's testimony that he and his Quran were divinely inspired is that Muhammad's character was a deficient, was as deficient, excuse me, and his life was as despicable as anyone who has ever lived.
we already covered the reasons why, some of the reasons why. These miracles attributed to Muhammad are, are later additions. The traditions concerning Muhammad were written down in Baghdad, not before centuries following Muhammad's death. Till that time, there were oral traditions which rest entirely in the memory of those who have handed them down. Many myths were invented and added to these oral traditions in an attempt to make Muhammad appear Masonic. The Muslim scholars who fabricated those miracles had well-defined agendas, and they had a practical and selfish reason to do so. And by the way, what I'm reading from is not an, a, a, a Christian source. It's not a Christian source. They can figure it out. Many myths were invented to add to these oral traditions in an attempt to make Muhammad appear to Masonic. The Muslim scholars who fabricated those miracles had well-defined agendas, and they had a practical and selfish reason to do so. By the time Muhammad started preaching, Christianity was well established. The very idea that Islam might be a new religion was unthinkable to Christians, and they took Muslims as theological deviants. But with time, Islam appeared as a religious rivalry to Christianity. So the Muslim scholars tried their best. They tried their best to make Muhammad look as godly as that of Jesus. Otherwise, they would have been out of business. As a result, since the Gospels proclaimed that, proclaimed that Christ was the light of the world, so Muslims contrived Allah first created the light of Muhammad, out of which Allah then proceeded to create everything which constitutes this world. They even demanded that Muhammad's body emitted luminous waves, rendering him visible in the thickest darkness. That's almost too funny. I have to read that, thing. Uh, read that again. They even demanded that Muhammad's body emitted luminous waves, rendering him visible in the thickness darkness. He glowed in the dark. He was psychedelic. I mentioned earlier if Enoch was in the Holy Scriptures, you imagine what man-made doctrines would produce from it. I talk about the Christian science fiction theories that man has produced on eschatology. If Enoch was included, let's just say this, it would be Christian science fiction theories on LSD, for those of you who know that, what that drug is. For Muhammad, his followers, take it all to an even lower level. I was going to say higher, but let's just say a lower level. They go to the extremes to try to prove how Muhammad not only could stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with Jesus Christ, but he's above him. And Jesus Christ will serve him because of all this mysterious qualities about Muhammad. By the way, most of these mysterious qualities were produced after he was dead by his followers because they had an agenda. They even demand that Muhammad's body emitted luminous waves, rendering him visible in the thickest darkness. Thickest darkness. One night, this mir miraculous light enabled Asha or Asha to find a needle she had lost. A living light bulb. A living lamp. I lost my needle. It's dark. Come here, Muhammad. Shine some light. Stand there till I find it. You see how ridiculous this, this is, folks? I declare to you tonight, if half the Muslims could hear the truth about what a fraud Muhammad was and his followers that went way beyond in creating these stories of imagination, Obviously, 
as we perceive it, for evil purposes. That only could stream forth from a seventh and then eventually an eighth beast to try to not just supplant, to be above Jesus Christ and make Christ his servant, Muhammad's that is. Also, Muhammad produced no shadow. Let's move along. There was another reason those miracles were fabricated. Since everything associated with Muhammad was demonic rather than divine, and this is from a non-Christian source, <laughs> and the Quran could not stand by his own merit, Muslim scholars choose to deceive others by fraudulent means to keep the falsehood of Islam alive and steady going. The bread and the butter of Muslim scholars and clerics come from the business of Islam. So Islam should survive. At least those lies, though ridiculous and childish, provided their profit with some impression of credibility which was sufficient to attract the feeble-minded people. These Muslims, by the way, feeble-minded people, and the more, and I'm not getting into this part of the history of it, were exposed to the truth at one time or another. Because one incident after another, they were trying to compare, you see that quite a bit in the Meccan environment, compare Muhammad to, with Jesus Christ or even the Old Testament prophets to see that what he was saying could be actually real or not. Of course, he felt short and they mocked him at first. And it was only through force he was able to subdue them. But it's not like these people were not exposed. They chose as the book of Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians says, they allowed themselves to fall into this delusion. Because why? They didn't want the truth. They wanted to believe the lie. They wanted to keep believing their lies. We've covered that. Second Thessalonians, I'll just read it to you again. And with all the deceitfulness, of unrighteousness unto them that perish because they received or not welcomed the love of the truth. The truth of what? Of the gospel. That they might be rescued or saved. And for this cause, the God, literally, shall send, send something into another, literally, a strong delusion, a powerful working of error that leads one astray because they want to be led astray because of the deceit and fraud that's presented to them. You got it? That they should believe a lie. It's not like they were not presented the truth. They just chose to believe pisteo in the Greek all trust and confidence what they believed in was the truth and not the gospel so they're turned over to this lie and deceit that was presented then by force through Muhammad now where were we these Muslim scholars passed the story on to the next generation and thereafter the story has only got greater soon it takes on a life of its own and becomes more colorful with time and enters the realm of folklore, myth, and legend. Ultimately, it is accepted by the mainstream Muslim as authentic. Today, the legend of Muhammad appears like a ridiculous collection of absurd fables and in the worst style. Muhammad appears like a ridiculous collection of absurd fables. According to another story, and these fables are so contradictory that inconsi and inconsistent that we cannot be certain for anything. Even the very existence of Muhammad was questioned. Oh, he existed. And I'll prove it to you in Scripture. Again, using a different area of Scripture when I get to it. According to the Quran, the only miracle associated with Muhammad was the revelation of the Quranic 
surahs themselves. But the satanic verses, verses incident even refuted this Quranic claim, which we already covered. The Quran is the only book which is expected to be read and recite in Arabic only. It is not necessary to understand the meaning of a single word. <laughs> That's a far cry different than we have here. What did Paul tell Timothy? Study to show thyself approved. I could go to many other verses. We're encouraged to learn and to grow, to know more about him. How are you going to increase your faith? How are you going to increase your knowledge of what God wants you to know? You think just reciting verses is going to cut it? Listen, even Christians that recite scriptures get it wrong. There's more to it than just that. In the Quran, there's a large number of contradictions and inaccuracies. Historical, scientific, numerical, and ethical errors. Grammatical errors. This book is haphazardly written. There is no chronology. There is no chapters of definite subject or matters. Often the verses are unrelated to each other. No chapter deals with a particular subject matter. A whole chapter is a mixture of many subjects at random. It is utter stupidity to believe that this is the book, that this book is from God. If Muhammad had been involved in a miracle or could do one, all he would have had to do to silence his critics was to explain the ones that had taken place or simply summon his, God, summon his God, God's power to perform one. But no, he failed miserably. Let's move along because I'm going to run out of time. Practically, everything associated with Muhammad was decidedly unprofit-like. Muhammad focused on hate, violence, and punishment. In his religion, war was elevated as supreme religious duty. He approved plunder. He approved incest, pedophilia. He approved thievery. He approved lying. He approved assassination, genocide, and rape in the name of God. Paradise is no way better than a brothel and hell is a torture chamber. Muhammad was so spiritually deprived that he could not see anything beyond earthly pleasures even after death. It is really surprising that today more than a billion Muslims, actually it's more than that now, over two billion put their blind trust in this 7th century criminal whose life was an example of what not to do. His God is an ugly God. His God is an ungodly God. This God is so ridiculous that he is ready to bribe men with the paradisical luxuries. And if man does not fall for it, he frightens human beings with the most sadistic torture of hell. Yet this God... Allah calls himself independent, absolute, and disinterested. Such a God is, not, is nothing but a clever myth invented by Muhammad. Oh, well, that's where I differ. I don't believe he was invented by Muhammad. <clears throat> See, I believe in a spiritual war that goes on in the unseen world. This is where I differ. There's a spiritual warfare that's going on in the unseen world. Throughout God's book, we learned about the certain beast that would come in the course of history at a certain time. And Muhammad made himself an available to, tool to be the representative to introduce the seventh beast, which now is the eighth, controlled by not only the demonic, but probably Satan himself. Because so, Satan always had a control. He's the general. He has many lieutenants and uh, colonels and lieutenants and foot soldiers which I have called before demons. 
disembodied giants, which I clearly pointed out in the book of Enoch. If you missed all this, where you've been? There's a lot that I've covered in the Spiritual Warfare series and other messages, also in this Last Day series. Everybody thinks a demon is a fallen angel. No, it isn't. A demon is not a fallen angel. A demon, according to the book of Enoch, was a disembodied spirit that would keep on existing that came from a dead giant before the flood. Fallen angels have their bodies. Satan has their body. They're not looking or seeking a body. Demons could possess, and they seek out bodies to possess because they're disembodied. And certain instructions were given what they could and couldn't do in the book of Enoch if they possessed the body. Now, can angels influence a body? Obviously. Could work your thoughts. Could get into your mindset. Could dictate your life. And have enough demons at his disposal, him and his fallen angel and army, to use at will. To possess a person. In possession, sorry, most possessions don't happen like Hollywood wants to portray it. Or some book writers that want to make a buck or two about demon possession. Sorry, your head's not going to spin. You're not going to throw up all over the place. All those things are possible. They're few and far between, though. Get that. Body contortions, facial changes, all those things are possible, but they're far and few between. It doesn't mean that you're not possessed if you're someone like Muhammad. Your possession is taken on a different form. He became a willing agent to be possessed. What in the heck is he doing in the cave? He was married to a rich woman. He traveled around as a merchant. It's not like he didn't have any desires, I mean, any needs that were not being fulfilled. What was he doing in the cave? Well, he's trying to find some spiritual enlightenment. In Scripture, anybody that found themselves in caves usually were running from trouble. David, so forth. Elijah. What trouble was he in? I've looked. I can't find any. He had everything going for him as the world would perceive it. So why run off to a cave to find spiritual enlightenment? You couldn't find anywhere, any other location? I mean, pitch a different tent, for crying out loud. There was something wrong with this person. We'll get into more of that in the future. But there was a spiritual war that was going on. Satan knew what time it was. He knew how he knows how much time that he had at that point, and it was not long before his final destruction also. He had to go to work. He had to find an agent, and he did. Unfortunately, Muslims put their blind trust in this 7th century criminal. He is ungodly. He's not a myth that was invented by Muhammad. Something possessed Muhammad's brain, and we know that something is. And I do believe Oh, he saw an angel, but it wasn't Grable. It wasn't a good angel in that cave. He did not hallucinate. It goes on this read, This way he would fool the people by personalizing his authority in the name of God. Well, I don't think he was trying to fool the people. I really believe he thought he did receive the message and Allah was his God, and the, one, and the, person, uh, the angel that gave him the message was truly Gabriel. I don't think he invented it. That's right different from these authors and historians. This is real stuff. They look at it as unreal because they don't understand the unseen war. But it was real. 
I don't think he tried to fool anyone. I think he tried to present it to it. And when it was not accepted, then he came by force. The possession took on a different nature. In theory, Muslims are following Allah's guidance, but in practice, they are offering their blind obedience to Muhammad. It's actually both. With all these revelations, Allah slowly moved away into the background, leaving the front seat to Muhammad. The authority of the Quran is unquestionable and leads to hell. Allah is very specific on this matter, Quran says. So you can't question the Quran. You can't question Allah. In the Quran, you'll find, O believers, do not ask questions about things that if revealed to you, you may cause you trouble. But if you ask a question about something when the Quran is being revealed, it will be made known to you. Allah has given you what you did, what, what you did to date. Allah is forgiving and forbearing. Now, some people before you did ask, some people also in the Quran, before you did ask such questions and later lost their faith because of the very, those very things. The following hadith confirms Allah's warning. Once again, I heard the Prophet say, Allah has hated you for asking too many questions. These two verses prove that Allah is an ima imaginary God. Well, he's not imaginary. He is a God, but he ain't the God. Why Muslims are not allowed... Well, he's not even really a God. He's not an imaginary God. It's a God. It's, it's, it's an angel, a fallen angel. They believe to be God, but it's not imaginary. That's my point. Why Muslims are not allowed to ask questions about the Quranic revelations? The answer is simple. If Muslims start asking questions, the imposture of Muhammad will be exposed and Islam will fail. Muslims generally incapable of questioning Islam, they dismissed every doubt and considered these things are incomprehensible incompre as tests of God. To pass that test, to prove their faith, all they have to do is believe in every nonsense, absurdity, unquestionably. By revealing those two verses in the guise of Allah, Muhammad had banished reasoning from the kingdom of faith, making fanaticism and founda the foundation of his doctrine. Anyone who questions Muhammad's authority had been mercifully killed. Truth and logic are the two biggest enemies of Islam. As another historian wrote, quote, He, Muhammad, clearly saw that the spirit of inquiry would not favor him. This is how Islam maintained itself. End of quote. Muhammad recommended blind faith without question, absolute obedience, because of inability to teach the faith intelligibly. That only came to pass after the, he was rejected at the first go. When the message was rejected because proofs were not given, and it didn't make any sense to these Meccans especially, they rejected him. So when he came back with force, then... What this author and his historians are trying to say, and they're right, but they gotta, you got to put this in historical perspective when it did happen. It happened after the fact that you cannot question, and if you question, you would die because it, they would kill you. The, the Muhammad followers, according to the instruction of Muhammad. Why? Because they knew they couldn't answer the questions intelligibly. So therefore... Put down any resistance by threatening them that they would lose their lives. He would not make the same mistake the first time, as the first time, when he was rejected and he had to run for his life from the Meccans. When he gained enough followers and he had enough power behind his force that was gathering, he went back in and he said, Do it or die. Don't question me. Don't question Allah. Don't question the messages that I receive from Allah. If you do, it was possible death. So you've got to put the historical sequence in order. Muhammad re recommended blind faith. No, he didn't recommend anything. It's another place where I differ. He demanded it. There's enough proof there. So I'm going to insert a word here that should be there. Not Muhammad recommended blind faith. Muhammad, he recommended blind faith the first go. But the second time around, he, Muhammad demanded blind faith without question absolute obedience because of his inability to teach the faith 
intelligibly. This is how the prophet of Islam succeeded in his religion, survived for more than 14 centuries. He had done whatever he liked in the name of Allah because all his actions counted as divine will. He claimed he had no choice but to act accordingly. Thus, whatever made hap whatever, thus, whatever made happen to others, Muhammad always remained blameless. But at the same time, he was never capable to prove his claim of prophethood, but still was not ready to give up his claim. There are more than sufficient proofs that he was a false prophet, but there is not a single proof of his prophethood. Muhammad's strong dominance urged Dominant's urge motivated him to rise above his fellow beings. He sought distinction by opposing his will on others. A book like the Quran was essential for him to achieve his goal. The core belief of Islam is wrong. It is nothing but the paranoid delusion and hallucination of an ordinary early medieval Arab businessman. Sorry, I disagree. The core belief of Islam is... Nothing but a paranoid delusion? No, it's, let's add spiritual possession by evil forces to convince him that what he was presenting was the truth. He was deceived, and he went on the mission to deceive others through the lies and the deceits that eventually more and more were presented. And then eventually the Quran was created to perpetuate those lies and deceit. Putting such vain self-delusion apart with the profound insights of Christ is plainly absurd. Well, I can even be harsher than that, but we'll just accept that for now. The basic truth is that Islam, that in Islam, everything is fake. The God is fake, the prophet is fake, and Allah message is also fake. It's fake to the extent that it's not the truth. But I believe he was convinced. And then eventually some followers that grew were convinced that it was the truth. We know it's false. It's a false message. It's worshiping a false idol. It's an extension of the moon god religion. And it leads to damnation. This also goes on to say that the critics of Islam know it very well. Let's move along because I have about five minutes or so. Well, I think I'll leave it right there. I'm thinking I'm going to leave it right there. I'm going to save that. Listen, folks. He cannot produce a miracle. When he tried to produce a miracle, it failed. And when it failed, he came up with excuses. And for a long time, I asked myself, why didn't Satan assist him in some of those miracles? He could have. He could have. So the only other question then is, was he allowed, not allowed by God, the God, to, to assist him in producing a miracle? Or did Satan, with a bigger picture in mind, did he just want some religion based on Supposedly, they th say Islam is based on peace and love and whatever you want to call Islam. If it went down the road where it was acceptable at the first go, because he had been proven to be prophet-like because of miracles, which in those days was a demand on many of the prophets to see if they were telling the truth or not. I ask myself, over and over, why didn't Satan allow that to happen? Did God stop him? The only conclusion that I could come down or come with that is acceptable in my mindset is 
and, I, and of course, I'm not giving you some of the information that brought me to this conclusion, but the conclusion I came to, because I'm saving it for a later time in this series, is because Satan had the big picture in mind. He knew that Islam could not be a religion of peace. And it isn't, no matter what anybody tells you. He knew that what he was going to try to achieve, including the destruction of Israel, and that includes, by the way, the little Satan and the great Satan, and that means all the tribes of Israel included, that's not going to come about with peace and love and goodwill. Was it? No. Satan doesn't operate that way when he has a long-term objective. That's why Satan really didn't interfere in Muhammad's first presentation to the, to the Arabians with the message of, this is what Gabriel's told me. I'm excited over it. Listen, fellows. This is, let's just call it, his good news. Get excited along with me. Satan didn't want that. Satan wanted a destructive religion established. And that's why he kind of just uh, was a shadow in the background, still dictating Muhammad's moves. But let Muhammad go through the motions. Let him feel the rejection. And then once he got Muhammad to a place where he was rejected, the only place Muhammad could go back to, the very caves that he hung out to get this message in the first place. And if you read the Quran and some other hadiths and historians close to Muhammad said that, basically, let me just give you a synopsis. He was encouraged by what he experienced after being rejected. And then he had the epiphany that they, if they're not going to accept it, accept it by just me presenting it to them, we'll take it by force. Satan waited, and he had him where he wanted. Because now, the seventh and eighth beast would come upon the world, not with peace and love and kindness, any attributes that you might see in the fruit of the Spirit, none of that. He would come because he is the father of lies, He's the father of destruction, and he will come with his last gasp, because he knows his time is limited, in an empirical system, such as Islam, it's not a religion, that comes with destruction, that comes along with the death, because it's based on lies and deceit. Satan knew what he was doing. And when he let Muhammad go through the motions, then he stepped in and demonized his mind even further, saying, if they're not going to take it by choice, eliminate the choice. Force it upon them. You look at it today. That same con concept is still there. Islam. You see that in the Iranians right now, but it's like that in all of Islam. Their whole objective is global dominance. Everything else is eliminated except what Muhammad preached, what Muhammad declared, and everyone that came after that that added to that message to be the true message, the only way of your rescue. You get it, folks? We're at the point now where he has Muhammad where he wants him. Turn away from that first movement, that first try, Muhammad. Now, let's go about a different route. Let's come in with the total destruction of what Islam is all about. 
can we find that in Scripture? And I might have to. I'm trying to hold out as long as I can because I want to do this all at once. Do we have that in Scripture that outlines what I just summarized to you in the last 10 minutes? The answer is yes. We do have it. We even have the order of how it would come down. The Christian world's been blinded enough with silly doctrines. The truth needs to be heard. And it will. You want me to continue? Maybe I'll do it tonight if I have enough of you that are interested. Play this song.